Well, good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to you. Lovely to see you as we gather together this morning uh, to worship God with one another. Just a, a few things for me to announce as we make our, our start uh, this morning. We're going to be in John's Gospel once again. We've been working our way through just the first chapter so far, and we'll look at the next little section of chapter one of John's Gospel uh, in our service this morning. Our service this evening is at six o'clock, and we're uh, pleased to have Jonathan Reed coming to take that service, and then refreshments will be served uh, after the service as well. Uh, this is half term week, and so uh, many of the regular ministries are, are not taking place this week as the leaders in those ministries have a, a well-earned break. Uh, but uh, as usual, there will be the prayer gathering at half past seven on Wednesday evening. And then looking ahead to next Sunday, uh, there'll be no Sunday school next week, but half past 11 for the morning service. Again, we'll be in John's Gospel, and that will be a communion service also. Uh, and then we're thankful to Alan Edgar for taking the service uh, next Sunday evening at six o'clock. Just a reminder about the shoe boxes as well, they're to be in for next Sunday, please. And uh, as well as that, uh, they're not able to be here this morning uh, for obvious reasons, but we're uh, so delighted uh, about the news from the MacArthur family and the, the safe arrival of Pirin uh, in the early hours of yesterday morning. So we give thanks to God uh, for that new arrival and uh, pray for God's blessing uh, upon the family at this time in particular. Well, as our call to worship uh, this morning, I'd like to read some verses from uh, the book of Isaiah and chapter 40, which is an important passage in relation to John chapter 1, as we shall see uh, later on. So hear these words from Isaiah chapter 40. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we're going to sing together our first item of praise this morning which is psalm 130 a great psalm which assures us of god's forgiveness uh, for his people the redemption that he has provided for us in christ psalm 130 lord from the depths i call to you lord hear me from on high and give attention to my voice when i for mercy cry we'll stand and sing together <laughs>
Please be seated and let's unite our hearts together in prayer now as we come before God with our prayers of adoration, confession, thanksgiving and our requests as well. Let's bring all these things to God in prayer as we pray together. Father, as we meet together this morning to worship you, we thank you for these wonderful verses of Psalm 130 that we've been able to sing together to you. That you are the God to whom we're able to cry out and to plead for mercy, knowing that we are sinful people, and yet knowing that with you there is forgiveness and there is plentiful redemption. Father, we thank you that that redemption that the psalmist speaks of in these verses has now been accomplished. And it's been accomplished by your Son and our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. And as the psalmist by faith looked forward to the time when all of your people's sin would be atoned for, we thank you that we can look back in faith and be assured that at the cross all of our sin has been paid for. We praise you that Jesus the promised Messiah, the promised Lamb of God, came into the world in order to take away the sins of the world. We thank you that by his death on the cross, he has secured forgiveness for all of our sins. We thank you that in him, you remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. You trample our sin underfoot. You cast it into the depths of of the sea you wash it away you remember it no more father we thank you for this lavish grace that you have poured out upon us in christ we thank you for the cross and all that jesus has accomplished there and as we come to you in prayer this morning we acknowledge that we are sinful people desperately in need of that redemption even as we've just sung a few moments ago that if you marked our transgressions no one could stand and yet with you there is plentiful redemption and father we pray that this morning as we gather to hear your word and as we are pointed to the lord jesus that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of him that we would grow in our assurance of sins forgiven that we would know that in him we are reconciled to you both now and forevermore and as well as that we pray that we would mature in christ growing up into him who is the head of the body we pray that you would bring comfort to those in times of need we pray that within the the fellowship of our church family here we would comfort and encourage one another and especially for those going through difficult times seasons of grief seasons of concern times of ill health lord we pray that you would draw near to them and encourage their hearts this morning we do think as well of of those who are not able to be here this morning for whatever reason and we ask that as they're parted from us yet they would be very aware of our prayers for them and your love towards them father as well as praying for the the church family we we want to pray for those who do not yet know christ as their savior there are those on our hearts perhaps they're familiar with the scriptures in many ways and yet as things stand they do not know jesus and we pray therefore that you would work in their hearts that you would draw them to the savior bring them to true repentance and saving faith in him father we I want to pray as well at this time for the MacArthur family. We rejoice at the happy news that we've heard of Piran's safe arrival yesterday. And we pray for him and for Laura as well as she recovers from the labour. And for the MacArthur family as a whole as they enter into this new phase of life as a family of four. Lord, may they know your blessing and help in every way in the days that lie ahead. Encourage their hearts, we pray. Father, as we pray for ourselves here, we're mindful of our brothers and sisters over in Stranmillis, and especially for the the service that went forth this morning over the radio. We thank you for the the word that was preached by John, and we pray that you would encourage his and all of their hearts at Stranmillis. 
And we ask, Father, that that word that has gone forth over the radio waves this morning, that it would be used greatly by you uh, to build up and, and bless your people uh, and to win uh, sinners to Christ as they hear the good news of Jesus proclaimed. Father, we thank you that this morning we're able to gather in this place in Christ's name and to worship you. And we pray that you would bless us this morning, that you would pour out your mercies upon us, that we'd be very aware of the Spirit's help and enabling in every aspect of our service, and that you would do us good, building up your people for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, we pray all of these things. Amen. Having just confessed our sin to God in prayer, let's hear uh, some words of encouragement, uh, assuring us of God's grace and forgiveness towards his people. And once again, we'll, we'll turn to Isaiah 40, just to hear a few words from the start of that chapter, which is so important in relation to John chapter 1. Isaiah 40 begins with these wonderful words. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So let's sing together now once again as we turn to hymn number 489. Show pity, Lord, O Lord, forgive, let a repenting rebel live. Hymn 489, and we'll stand and sing together. seated. Let's turn to John's Gospel in chapter 1. We'll read a section this morning beginning from verse 19. So John chapter 1, beginning from verse 19. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, 
I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now we finish at verse 28 this morning and pray for God's blessing as his word is heard read and preached today. Let me invite the the boys and girls to come and take a a seat at the front, please, as we spend a few minutes speaking in particular to them. Great, guys, lovely to to see you all uh, this morning. I want to ask you, uh, first of all, a, a quick question, and that is, Who is the most important person you've ever met? Yes, we'll we'll give them up with you guys. God? Fantastic. Great answer first of all, yes. Say or go along the lines. The king? Excellent answer, yes. Elliot? Me. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent answer, yes. Thank you. You're very kind. Edith, your hand was up. Who's the most important person you've ever met? Me. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so it's basically me or the king. You know, <laughs> the king the Fantastic. Well, I was kind of anticipating that Sadie might say that she met the king, because I think was it last year uh, you met the king. I managed to find a photograph uh, this morning of uh, that meeting taking place. If we zoom in here, there's the, the back of the king's head at the front of Sadie. This was an opportunity last year which came up to, to be able to meet uh, the king. I think maybe some of you might have seen the king whilst he was here as well. And you know, when you meet someone very, very important, maybe a king or, or someone like that, uh, it's important that you prepare for that meeting. And I, I know Sadie uh, had to get ready for that time when she was going to see the king. Now, she didn't know that it was going to be the king who was going to be there. But nonetheless, there were certain preparations. Say they had last night was singing a song uh, for the king and, and queen. And so there was lots of rehearsal, making sure that they all knew the lines of the song and could sing it well. So they prepared in that way. But also on the day itself, of course, you need to make sure that your, your shoes are clean and polished, that uh, your school uniform is looking good, that your face is washed, that your hair is done nicely. When you meet someone really important, there are certain things you have to do to prepare for meeting them. And really that's what this bit of the Bible that we're looking at this morning is all about. It's about John the Baptist, who you've probably heard of. And John's job really was to get people ready to meet someone really, really important. So who was John getting people ready to meet? Who do you think? Yeah, Miriam. That's right. The King of Kings. He was, it was John's job to tell people about <coughs> how Jesus was going to come and visit his people and that they must be ready to meet Jesus, the King of Kings. And how do people get ready to, to meet Jesus? It's not about shining their shoes or anything like that. Yeah, yes, it is. What, what are you going to say there? How do people get ready to meet Jesus? Um, they have to get dressed up for the Well, maybe to do that as well, yes. So the, the, the thing that John was telling people to do 
will take her away from their sin and to turn towards Jesus. That's the way to be ready uh, to meet Jesus. Turn away from your sin and turn to Jesus and trust in him. Or we sometimes put it like this, repenting means turning away from sin and faith, trusting in Jesus. And that's what God is doing. He was telling people, the king of kings is coming. You need to be ready to meet him. So turn away from your sin and trust in him. And actually that's what all of us <coughs> need to do. Not just the people John was speaking to, but all of us. We all need to turn away from our sin and trust in Jesus so that we're ready to meet him. And I don't know what one of the girls has done that. Although he said, I think he was doing that and, and pondering how important this is. But one day you can meet the most important king of all, Jesus. And therefore we need to turn from us sin, trust in Jesus. And if so, we will be forgiven of all of those sins and we live forever and ever with Jesus. So thank you so much for listening uh, this morning, darling. Thank you. Thank you. Father, we, we do thank you uh, for what John the Baptist told the people all those years ago. Thank you that he told them that the greatest king of all, Jesus, was coming to them, and they must be ready for him. They must turn away from their sin and be ready to receive their king. And Father, help all of us, and in particular we pray for these little ones at the front, uh, that you would do that work in their hearts, that they would turn away from their sin and turn to Jesus and trust in Him so that they can know that they're friends with you forever and can be ready to meet Jesus one day, face to face. Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, you can head up back to your seats. Thank you. We're going to sing hymn number 435. Stand and sing together. <laughs> Please be seated and let's pray together now. Father, we do ask that as we've just sung, that the gospel's conquering power would be felt now by all assembled here. Bless, we pray, the preaching of your word and show us your son and bring us to him in repentance and faith because we ask it in his name and for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, please do have your Bible open in front of you there. Uh, John's Gospel this morning, we're going to home in on chapter 1 and verses 19 through to 28. And we come this morning to really the start of the story of, of John's Gospel. Because everything that we've looked at so far in this series, in those first 18 verses of the chapter, has been the prologue 
where John introduces to us the grand themes of the gospel concerning who Jesus is as the eternal Son of God become flesh, come into the world, that those who receive him and believe in his name can be made the children of God and have everlasting life with him. But in verse 19 and onwards, we, we get to the story itself. The historical account of the life of Jesus. But the story begins actually with the ministry of John the Baptist. Over in Mark's Gospel, Mark gives us a bit more information about what that ministry of John the Baptist looked like. And so Mark tells us it in Mark chapter 1 John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So John the Baptist is out in the, the wilderness by the river Jordan. Crowds and crowds of people are traveling out into the, the wilderness in order to hear John preach and also to be baptised by him in the River Jordan. Uh, and so John's ministry had become massively popular. We need to remember, over 400 years had gone by since the last prophet that God had sent to his people. 400 years of prophetic silence. And then all of a sudden, this man appears, who seems to be some sort of prophet. And it looks like some kind of revival is now breaking out. It appears that God is on the move again, so to speak. Something significant is happening. And maybe even this is the end of the age. And so a group of religious leaders are sent from Jerusalem to go and check out what's going on. A group of priests and Levites and also some Pharisees are sent from Jerusalem to go and meet with John out in the wilderness and ask him what all of this means. So this morning we're going to just look at this brief conversation that John has with these religious leaders. And we're going to see that the conversation touches on four particular topics which together helpfully summarise for us what John the Baptist was really all about. So we're going to think about John's identity, John's message, John's sign, and John's Lord. Those are the four topics of conversation. So here's the, the first thing that we're going to notice. John's identity is the voice. John's identity is the voice. I wonder if you've ever played the children's game, Guess Who? It's a, a fun game. Your opponent has a card on their, in front of them in their hand with a, a picture of a face on it. And in front of you, there is a board with a, a whole array of different faces. And by asking certain questions, you've got to try and figure out which face matches your opponent's card. And so you might ask, well, is it a man or a woman? Does he have a beard? Is he wearing a hat? And hopefully after a few questions, you've figured out who it is. Well, the first part of the, the conversation between John and the religious leaders sounds a bit like a game of guess who, doesn't it? These religious leaders have, have come from Jerusalem. And their first question is, who are you? And you see, the, the issue is John's identity. Who is he? And they make three guesses. The first guess is really the big one. Are you the Christ? That's what they asked him. Are you the Christ? Because God's people were waiting for the Christ, that is the Messiah, to come to them. The, the promised saviour king. The one who would defeat God's enemies, save God's people. Establish God's kingdom, rule forevermore. And in those days especially, 
expectations of the Messiah were particularly high. The Jews were living under the authority of the Roman Empire. And people were thinking and hoping that maybe soon God would send this promised Christ. This king who would overthrow the Romans. Who would make the kingdom of Israel great once again. So here's the big question. John, are you the Christ? Is that what's happening here with all of these thousands of people gathering to you to listen to you? Well, John is emphatic in his response. We read there in verse 20, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Absolutely not. John nips that thought in the bud. He doesn't want people thinking that he is the Messiah, not at all. And so the religious leaders, they then make their second guess. And they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? And what makes them ask that? Well, they have in their mind the very last prophecy from the very last prophet that we find in the Old Testament of our Bibles. Remember, it's been 400 years since God had sent a prophet to them. And that prophet was Malachi. And Malachi's book ended with a particular prophecy. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So it's a good guess, isn't it? John, are you actually Elijah? And John says, I am not. And he says that because they'd misunderstood that prophecy from Elijah, uh, from Malachi. It wasn't literally that Elijah would come again but instead that there would be a prophet come along who in many ways resembled Elijah in terms of how he lived and what he looked like and what he said. And John the Baptist was indeed that man, the one like Elijah, but he's not literally Elijah, not literally a second appearance of Elijah come again. So the religious leaders are wrong. This is not literally Elijah that has come. And so they now make their third guess. They say, are you the prophet? And this time they're thinking about a, a prophecy uh, that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses had prophesied that one day in the future God would send a great prophet, indeed the great prophet, to his people. One who would reveal to them most clearly and most fully the will and the word of God to them. So Moses had said back in Deuteronomy 18, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And so the religious leaders think, well, if John the Baptist is not the Christ that we're waiting for, and if he's not Elijah, come back to us again, well, maybe he's the prophet that we were told to expect. But again, they're wrong. Are you the prophet, they ask? And John simply replies, no. And this game of, of guess who is not going very well for them. And they give up. And they simply say to John, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John gives them the right answer. He tells them, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And so the Old Testament passage they should have turned to was not Malachi 4 or Deuteronomy 18. Instead, the right answer is Isaiah 40. An amazing, amazing chapter of the Bible. Read the whole thing when you get home. And towards the start of that chapter, Isaiah makes a certain prophecy about a voice that will one day be heard. And the prophecy tells us nothing more about this person other than the fact that one day their voice will be heard. This person will be a, a preacher, a herald. And the voice will be heard in the wilderness. The wilderness there is both literal and figurative. John the Baptist's voice was literally heard in the wilderness. That's where he did his preaching. And yet the wilderness spoken of in Isaiah 40 is also a figurative wilderness. It's a picture of spiritual barrenness. 
in a context of spiritual decline, in a, a context of a lack of fruitfulness amongst God's people, this voice is going to be heard. So John's identity is the voice. He is the one who was promised back in Isaiah 40. And so the religious leaders have now got the answer that they came looking for. But it's an answer that raises more questions. Because if John's identity is the voice, well, the question is, what is this voice saying? And that's the second topic in the conversation, John's message. And what we find is this, John's message is repentance. Uh, think of this picture in your mind. Think of a, a road that is full of potholes and it gets smoothed over and, and filled in until it's a nice, smooth road. And that's the picture that, that John's message really encapsulates. Uh, John's message can be likened to someone giving the order for a road that had fallen into a bad state of disrepair being resurfaced and so John's message was really a kind of highway maintenance if we can put it in those terms again Isaiah 40 gives us the fuller description of that listen to the, the language that Isaiah uses of of highway maintenance he says in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Again, picture it in your mind's eye. Imagine a road stretching through a wilderness landscape. And the road is rough, uneven, potholes everywhere. The road twists this way and that. It undulates up and down hills and valleys. If you tried to, to drive your car along this road, it would be an extremely uncomfortable journey. And then as you're looking at this rough road, you then hear the voice in the wilderness. What is the voice saying? He, he's calling for some serious highway maintenance to take place. The voice says, make straight the highway. Fill in all of those potholes, resurface the road, lift up the valleys, bring low the hills, make the uneven ground level, make the rough places a plain. When the voice says that, then along come all of the diggers and bulldozers and the excavators and the steamrollers, and they get to work. And eventually, when their work is done, there is this beautiful, flat, straight, smooth road stretching through the wilderness. And the question is, why does all of this highway maintenance need to take place? And the answer is because a very special visitor is about to make his way along that highway. And in those days, if a, a king or an emperor was going to come and visit a town or city, this is what they would do. Part of the preparations for the visit would involve making sure that the road into that city was up to scratch so that when the king came to town, riding in his chariot, he would have a smooth journey. They would make all of the preparations so that when the king arrived, he could be received and welcomed fittingly. And this is why the voice in the wilderness called for this kind of highway maintenance. It's because someone very important was coming to visit. Someone far greater, in fact, than any mere earthly king or emperor. Listen again to what Isaiah says about the voice in the wilderness. The voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's what the voice was saying. God himself is coming to visit. And so you'd better be ready for him. Be ready to welcome him. Be ready to receive him rightly. Be ready to meet your God when he comes to you. Make straight the highway for our God. 
Now, of course, this language of highway maintenance that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 40, and which is referred to here in John chapter 1 by John the Baptist, is not literal highway maintenance. John is not literally telling people to make a, a nice road through the wilderness. No, it's picture language, isn't it? And it's a picture of repentance. As John, the gospel writer, has already told us in the prologue, the eternal Son of God was coming into the world. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God himself, in the person of Jesus, came to visit the earth. And how were people to prepare to meet him? How were they to be ready to receive him rightly? How were they to welcome him? By repentance. And to repent literally means to turn around, turn away from your sin. Turn towards Jesus. Every bit of you, your head, your heart, your hands. What your mind believes, what your heart cherishes, what your hands do. All turning away from sin. And all turning towards Jesus in faith. That's what John's message was about. It's what the voice in the wilderness was calling for. John's message was repentance. Because in the person of Jesus, God himself was coming to them. And that message applies not only to the people of John's generation, but it's the message that we all need to respond to. One day you will meet Jesus face to face. One day he will come to the earth again, but next time to bring judgment. And so the most important question you need to answer is, how can you be ready for him? How can you be ready to meet Jesus? And John's message tells us you need to repent. You need to turn away from your sin. You need to turn to Jesus. You need to trust him to save you. Have you done that yet? Are you ready to meet him? And if you have done so, well, you need to keep on repenting. Because repentance is not just something that you do once at the start of your Christian life. No, as as Martin Luther, who we often think of at this time of year, famously put it, the whole Christian life is one of repentance. And so even if you're a Christian, you need to look at your life this morning and ask yourself, are there any potholes that have opened up in my life? Where is the road not smooth? Where is there some highway maintenance needed? Where have sins started to fester in my life and I've let them go on too long and it's spoiling things? And by grace, turn away from them. Turn to Jesus for forgiveness for all of those things and for lasting change which only he can bring. John's message is the the message we all need to hear, isn't it? Whether we're a Christian or not. John's message was repentance. And that message was accompanied by a sign. And that's the third topic that comes up in this conversation. Notice this thirdly. John's sign was baptism. His sign was baptism. And in verse 25, the religious leaders now have another question for John. They say to him, then why are you baptizing if you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? Now we need to remember that baptism was not a new thing. It wasn't invented by John the Baptist. Uh, the, the scriptures speak of various baptisms in the, the Old Testament law. Uh, and as well as that, there was a, a particular kind of baptism in those days known as proselyte baptism. That is, when a a Gentile person wanted to convert to Judaism, they and the members of their household would have to undergo a a baptism ceremony. And it was a sign showing that by nature, the Gentiles were unclean people under Old Testament law. They were unclean before God. And therefore, if they wanted to be a part of God's people, they needed cleansing. And so the religious leaders who are asking John these questions would have been well aware about baptism because it was there in the Old Testament. There were various baptisms, as Hebrews chapter 9 in the New Testament says, 
and as well as that, the proselyte baptism that was common in those days. But this is what troubles them. What gives John the authority to be administering baptism like this? If he's not the Christ, if he's not Elijah, and he's not the prophet, does he really have the authority to baptize people? Not just anyone can baptize people. And what's more, the, these are Jewish people that John is baptizing. Now, if they were Gentiles, the religious leaders would probably have been okay with John baptizing Gentiles. After all, every self-respecting Jew knew that under the Old Testament law, the, the Gentiles were unclean people, and they needed cleansing, that cleansing pictured by baptism, if they were to come and be a part of God's people. But by baptizing Jews, you see what John is implying, don't you? He's implying that whoever you are, whatever your heritage is, whatever family you're born into, whatever background you come from, it doesn't matter. You still need to repent of your sin. You need to be cleansed of that sin, to be brought into fellowship with God and be a part of his people. That's the scandal, isn't it, that provokes this question. Is it not enough that these are Jewish people descended from Abraham? Do they really need baptism as well? And John, by the actions of his ministry, is making it very clear, yes, they do need baptism. Now, it needs to be said, John's baptism was not the same as what we now would refer to as Christian baptism. The baptism that John administered was superseded by the baptism that Jesus instituted, baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why in the book of Acts, people who are baptized with John's baptism are then baptized again with baptism in the name of the triune God. John's baptism gave way to the baptism instituted by Christ. But the point of John's baptism remains that whoever you are, and however privileged your background and upbringing may be, however closely associated with God's people through family connections or whatever, none of that is enough. And whoever you are, you need to repent for the forgiveness of your sins. You need to be cleansed of them through Jesus. And so John's sign was baptism, and this is what it meant. And yet notice this, that, that John moves the conversation on very quickly away from the topic of baptism to the, the fourth and the final topic in the conversation. These religious leaders have asked him a question about baptism. And yet there's something else that John wants to talk to them about even more than baptism. He wants to talk to them about Jesus. And so here's the fourth and the final thing that we're going to see John's Lord is Jesus. John's sign was baptism, but John's Lord was Jesus. Notice how John moves the conversation from baptism to, to Jesus himself. He, he answers the question like this, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. And without mentioning his name personally, John says that there is one standing among them who comes after him. Who's the person who comes after John? Well, the prologue has told us, hasn't it, already? Verses 14 and 15. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. So the one who comes after John is none other than the Word become flesh. That is, the eternal creator, God the Son, come to earth as a human being. And so even though the ministry of Jesus came after John's ministry, Jesus ranks before John because Jesus was before John. 
He's existed for all eternity. The eternal Son of God. This was God himself coming to them. And as John spoke these words, God incarnate was even standing among them. Perhaps, or perhaps not literally, at that very moment, standing amongst the crowd that day. But already he was standing among the people of Israel. He'd already made his arrival. The word become flesh was already dwelling amongst them. And that's why John says he is not worthy even to untie Jesus' sandals. In those days, the, the job of taking off the master's sandals and then washing his feet was the job that the lowliest servant in the household did. It's notable, isn't it, that Jesus himself did that, taking the place of the lowest servant, washing his disciples' feet. A picture of how low he would stoop in his humiliation in order to wash his people clean through the death of the cross. And John says, I, I'm not even worthy of doing that. I'm not even worthy of, of stooping down and untying Jesus' shoelaces. Such is the greatness of Jesus. I'm not even worthy of being his lowliest servant. John's Lord is Jesus. Now John was without doubt the most famous and the most popular person in Israel in those days. Thousands of people were walking miles to go and hear him. And yet John is, is the first to admit he is nothing, nothing at all compared to his Lord Jesus. John is just a voice that tells people about Jesus. And as John would later say, I must decrease and he must increase. Because at the end of the day, it's not about John and it's not even about baptism. It's about Jesus. And yet notice what John says there in verse 26 he says among you stands one you do not know one you do not know remember John is speaking to religious leaders here speaking to priests and Levites and Pharisees He's speaking to the most biblically literate people in the land experts in the Old Testament scriptures better than anyone they knew the prophecies and the promises that God had given concerning the coming Messiah and now that Messiah was standing amongst them. And yet they did not know him. As the prologue has told us, he came to his own people, the Jews, and they did not know him and they did not receive him. And it's a challenging thought, isn't it? You can have the scriptures at your fingertips. You can have a head that is crammed full of Bible verses. And you can be familiar with Deuteronomy 18 and Malachi 4. And you can throw in Isaiah 40 as well for good measure. And yet you can still not know Jesus. And that was the problem for these religious leaders, wasn't it? They knew their Bibles well enough. They knew all of the prophecies and promises about the coming Messiah. And with that head full of biblical knowledge, they could come to John and speak to him and play this biblical game of guess who off the top of their heads. No problem. Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And yet they didn't know Jesus. And that's the challenge to end with, isn't it? Simply, do you know him? Not do you know the scriptures, good though it is to know the scriptures. Not simply, are you a baptized person? Wonderful though it is to be a baptized person. But the question is, do you know Jesus? John's Lord is Jesus. Is he your Lord as well? Do you know him? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that all of your promises are true and we thank you that just as Isaiah prophesied, that one day a voice was heard in the wilderness. And it was the voice of John the Baptist. And he was calling people to prepare to meet the coming Messiah by repenting of their sins and being washed clean of them. 
Father, we pray that you would give us repentant hearts that turn away from our sin and turn to Jesus and receive forgiveness and cleansing in him. Father, we thank you for what your word says about him. But we pray that we wouldn't just know these things in our heads, but more than that, that we would come to Jesus in faith, unworthy though we are, and that by grace we would come to know Jesus, whom to know is life itself. We thank you for our Saviour. We thank you for our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray all of these things. Amen. We're going to close by singing together hymn number 454. It is not by works of righteousness, which our own hands have done, but we are saved by sovereign grace, abounding through the Son. Hymn number 454. Let's stand and sing together. close receive these words of benediction the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore amen